introduced something um, yesterday, um, so-called Bayesian networks. I tried to, like, you know, encourage you to not, like, you know, just ignore them because they're called Bayesian, because they're really cool. Um, and the whole idea is, um, as you'll see um, today, is that they allow us to estimate a function with an uncertainty. And um, the way I motivated them, I introduced them, you notice, is basically like, you know, appealing to physicists who know how to, how to do a fit. And I think, like, you know, if you know how to do a fit, it's very easy to understand, um, to understand these, these Bayesian networks. Um, what I didn't actually get to yesterday was to explain, I mean, how on earth they give you an error bar. Like, you know, I introduced, like, you know, some stuff, but I didn't actually introduce the error bar. So let's, like, you know, go back and do that. Like, let me repeat just because it's always good to, do we actually need it? Well, it's always good to see a loss function on the, on the blackboard. So let me uh, like, you know, write again the loss function of this Bayesian network. Um, and that was, um, we had that last time. Don't, well, you're not copying anything anyhow. So there's an integral a sampling over the uh, network parameters theta. Um, just to remind you, these network parameters are the, what we call W and B like, you know, in, our, in, in our deep network. So these are the, um, the parameters that we're looking at. And, um, they have a distribution, and this is like, you know, trained into the network, and then it's a logarithm of, um, wait, the probability describing, no, I need to get this right, some training data, giving these network parameters, that's the first term of the loss function, and the second that uh, we now are allowed to call a regularization, because I told, showed you, like, you know, what it does for the Gaussians was this. Um, um, regularization between a prior that we had to introduce and that as good non-Bayesians, we, Bayesians, we will vary and we will check, check, check for its effect. Um, bottom line is don't make it too narrow because then you inhibit the network from, learning, from like moving around. If you make it too big, too wide, then you just like make it a little harder for the network. And like, you know, and this is our Q. These are our, our distributions that um, our um, network parameters can follow. And as I said, this Bayesian network is something that I love. And we do this in my group. And like, I you know, I'm convincing lots of people. Oh, I should say, like, you know, I can say that in front, of the, in front of the camera. Like, you know, the arguably most conservative people in, like, you know, Atlas and probably also CMS are a bunch of people who, like, you know, are worried that they understand their QCD jets right. It's the so-called jet calibration people. Um, they are very serious scientists. They're very serious about uncertainties. They're very serious about like, getting everything right because they calibrate an object that everything else, a, uh, else in, in Atlas and CMS is based on. And if they screw it up, like, you know, the number of screwed up analysis is going to be literally infinite. So like, you know, they're, they're super conservative. And I recently talked to a bunch of these jet, cal jet calibration guys because they want to use you know, neural networks and they like them and so on and so forth. And they actually liked especially these Bayesian networks because of the additional control and because of the additional um, of, uh, uncertainties, um, uh, measures that, that they give them. So these networks are like, you know, for hardcore physicists, if you want. Proper hardcore people. Okay, so this is the, the loss function. And then let me also write down, like, you know, what we wanted to um, encode in the network. And that was, in our case, like, you know, just a regression. And I call this an amplitude over, over, um, over phase space. And I'm just repeating the formulas from last time. So um, the amplitude um, exploitation value here um, had two, um, two sampling steps. Like, you know, one was if you know the, the, the probability distribution over the amplitudes, you have to do an integral over the amplitudes. And then we have to do the integral over the, over the network weights, A, and then P of A given theta, and P of theta, of G, theta giving the training data. Um, and remember, like, you know, this is just what I had this on the blackboard last, last time, and this is just like two integrations, a little bit of an exercise in conditional probabilities, and then this is trivially true. And I'm omitting all the X prime, um, um, dependence here. And, you know, after training our network, we replaced this function here, which, like, you know, is not tractable, but, like, you know, it's something that, you know, that, like, you know, tells us everything about the training data and how, like, that enters um, the theta representation, and we replace that with this learned function Q here. So that's a dA d theta, a p of a given theta, q of theta. And now there is no dependence on the training data because we assume that everything with the trainer data has actually been learned or uh, trained into this function q. 
And uh, let me like, you know, introduce a shortcut here now. And you see the way I introduce this, um, and that's the mathematical, like, you know, the simple trick um, that's behind the evaluation of these networks. The way I introduce this, I first had the integral over A, and then I had like, you know, P of like P um, um, A um, um, given the training data, and then I divided this up into theta. Now let me like, you know, in, uh, reverse uh, the, the order of the integrals. Um, so now write D theta, Q of theta, right? And call the rest of it, like, you know, this entire A integral here, uh, something like whatever, A bar. I mean, just need a symbol with a bar of theta now defined as an integral over dA. Uh, what else are we missing here? We're missing that A. And um, then we're missing the P of A given theta. Um, that's obviously correct. I mean, because nothing has happened. Right? I mean, this is just like switching the... Um, switching the definitions um, of the, of, uh, in the integral, and like, but, this, but that's actually the way we're going to like, you know, now evaluate the network. So like, Q of theta, this is like, you know, encoded in the network. These kind of this combination, and we should be able to evaluate the network now. And be evaluated, evaluating the network. Here you see by sampling over the network parameters. This is like, you know, about the switch in the two, in these two, um, in these two, in, the, in this order has like given us. Okay. You look at that. This is a sampling over the network parameters following the network distributions that we have encoded, like, you know, like uh, the parameter distribution that we have encoded the network over some object that I called a bar here. Um, if you think about that, um, well, I can take this expectation value, and you know, like, you know, mathematically, every time you can write down an expectation value, um, you can also write down a variance, right? I mean, so, like, you know, everybody knows how to write the variance just by copying the symbols. So let me, like, you know, call this sigma tot here squared. Now I write this as the variance just the same way. dA, d theta. And then now you look at, like, you know, at your favorite book, and you say, like, you know, if you calculate the variance instead of this A, all you need to do is A minus A expectation value thing squared. Same two functions here, P of A given theta and P of theta given the training, or, like, or actually, P of... A given theta and Q, let me just start here. And if you have an expectation value, you have a variance, and that variance has to be that, right? Just by the usual definition of the variance. Um, that variance actually, um, if you want, now if you sample over it, right, you can do the same play, the same trick. Theta here, Q here, and then the rest of it, and that gives you, like, you know, the object that you sample over to, like, you know, to, to give you the uncertainty. So clearly you can, like, you know, by sampling over theta, following the distribution Q of theta, you can calculate for the amplitude at your point, phase space point x, you can calculate the expectation value and the variance or standard deviation. That gives you error estimate from that formula immediately, right? Nothing, nothing complicated, really as simple. Um, what I want to show you is there's actually a little bit of a trick um, to, like, you know, even, like, you know, look into the structure of the sigma tot. Um, which works by like splitting these two terms in a smart way. And so this is, um, chuk, chuk, chuk. yeah, let's just do this step by step. So dA d theta. Um, now yeah, as, as I bracket this out here. Um, a expectation value squared, oh, like that. Nothing happening here. Then, um, so this is just like dragging it out. Now I'm splitting this, like, you know, into, into three different integrals, these three terms. Uh, why, why do I do that? Because you see, um, I can pull the A expectation value out of the integral. So, like, you know, I can simplify things a little. So the first integral here is actually not simplified at all. Actually, wait. Yeah. Oh, and let me switch uh, the integration order just like I did here. Um, take Q of theta out. And so this is my theta integral. And then I have the A integral. As I told you, like, you know, they like, behave differently um, because the A expectation value can, can be pulled out of the integral. The first term, though, nothing happens. It's a dA, A squared, P of A given theta. The second term here is a minus 
twice a expectation value, leaving the integral, integral dA, a, p of a given theta, right, plus a expectation value squared, integral um, dA, p of a given theta. Bracket, bracket close. These are just two integrals. And, um, okay, in a very slight abuse of notation, I can, um, you see, I can take this bar here over A, which is defined as the expectation value, like, you know, like um, of, of A, given the distribution P of A given theta after integral over A, I can generalize this to here, this case where I would do, could now call this an A squared bar. I mean, just, just like, you know, um, writing this down. So, like, you know what I write. It's a d theta q of theta. And then I have this one here, a squared bar. Like, you just a squared, and, like, you know, then you have a squared bar. A squared bar is not a bar squared, obviously, because of that integral thing, right? Um, now, be careful, like, you know, these things depend on theta. Um, whereas A expectation value has an integrated out theta. So this, like, you know, I can keep that explicit. Then I have minus 2 A expectation value here, and this is nothing but exactly the A bar of theta um, plus A expectation value squared, um, just times the normalization condition here. But if this is a the probability, then that term here is going to be 1, is integral over a, p of a given something, it's a probability distribution, that's 1. Okay, now um, I can split this, these, this here, in a smart way. And um, let me just do that for you. So I can do this q of theta here, and I can, um, a bar square, yeah, I can, I can split this here by introducing, an, in addition, a term a bar squared. You'll see in a second why that is useful. So like introduce an a bar squared, which means that I have here, the first term um, is an a squared, no, it's an a squared bar of theta. This is that term here. And then I introduce a minus a bar squared. So the square is really above the bar here. That's the first term. And if I do that, then you see here, this just becomes a squared, right? So now I have plus, and then I have in parentheses, I have an A bar squared minus A expectation value, no, an A bar minus A expectation value, whole, th whole thing squared. A bar of theta minus A expectation value, whole thing squared. Right? I mean, that's obviously just little part, a few lines of math, not super complicated. However, that allows us, let's see, to define two different, two different uncertainty measures. Like, you know, one is here and one is here. Um, so I can, basically, can write now sigma tot, the uncertainty squared here has two contributions, and I just give them names, which are like, you know, historic to some degree. Um, so the first one here, um, we named this sigma sto stochastic, um, which then turned out in the second paper to be total nonsense, but let me still call it sigma stochastic squared. Um, and this one here, the, se um, um, the second term, um, people call for historic reason uh, sigma predictive, sigma pred. And extremely suggestively, they add in quadrature. You know that, so they're two sources of uncertainties because two sources of uncertainties always add in quadrature, right? So, like, you can think of them really as two sources of uncertainties. Now, if you think, if you look at them differently, right? So, a sigma pred here, this is the historic one that, like, you know, every, everybody knows how to do, is um, the integral now d theta, q of theta, um, and then it has this a bar of theta minus a, a expectation value, whole thing squared. Um, OK, what do we know about that? Um, what we know about this is 
if you do go into the limit of our um, deterministic network, where Q actually, a Q of theta um, becomes a data distribution where all thetas just assume their, like, you know, best values uh, theta or not, and nothing else happens. So, like, you know, they're not allowed to fluctuate anymore. Um, well, then you see then this, this thing vanishes. You evaluate that A bar here at theta zero, and this is, is, is A expectation value. But if, if you think about it, A expectation value is also really just A bar by that definition here, evaluated at, like, you know, the best value point. So which means um, this is A bar minus A bar, all evaluated at theta zero, so this is zero. That's good, because that tells us something about this uncertainty, and that is if your network is like, you know, well-trained, super well-trained, like, you know, all distributions are super narrow, everything is perfectly trained, then this uncertainty will go, into, go down to zero. How do I achieve that? Like, well, I, I achieve that by having a generally powerful, a powerful enough network and just throw away the training data, more and more training data, like, you know, as much as exists in the world, and eventually, like, you know, the network will be super well-trained if it's powerful enough. So you can think of this here as the statistical uncertainty. Statistical uncertainty, right? Okay, whereas the second one, sigma stochastic, as we call it, squared is d theta q of theta. Now this is second, the first term here. Um, this is this a bar squared minus a squared bar. Um, a squared bar theta minus a bar squared of theta. Well, yeah. Um, it looks like a typical, like, you know, like, you know, variance, if you think about this. Um, and quite honestly, there's only so much that I can, talk, so I can say about it. I certainly, in the limit where Q becomes incredibly narrow, when this gives you something very narrow, but then this gives you, like, the difference between first squaring and then integrating here over A, or first integrating and then squaring, and that's not going to go to zero. I mean, it's going to give you something, right? It's going to be something that depends on how, how well, um, you know, the network has learned, like, you know, the properties. So this one here, you can think of um, as a systematic uncertainty. And um, yeah, I mean, there's so much like, you know, we can do about it, right? OK. Um, I should say, um, what can these systematic uncertainties come from? The, like we call that in the paper like stochastic uncertainty because if your training data is intrinsically stochastic, right? Then, no matter how well you, well you train your network, like, there's always like, you know, residu residual uncertainty in, training the, in learning the, uh, some kind of underlying density. You, you never learn this, this perfectly because there's stochasticity in data, and that stochasticity doesn't get, go away if you have more training data. It's still stochastic, right? Um, noisy data, same thing. But then it turns out, like, you know, even if you have no perfect data and it's not sto stochastic at, uh, at, um, at all, this is still a finite um, the contribution which can come, to come for, for instance, from like, you know, just the expressivity of the network. I mean, it, it might just, the network might not be perfectly expressive, and they would also generate one of these uncertainties. These things will always go to zero, but like, you know, this is like kind of the leftover. So like, you know, I think of this as systematic and, stochastic, uh, systematic and statistical uncertainties. Statistical uncertainty is something you can actually reduce. If you have more data, it's like a well-defined path to reducing them. But you know, like anybody who's an experiment knows uh, systematic uncertainty is the pain in the butt. Like, you know, by all kinds of effects, like, you know, effects like keep your analysis from getting better, and then you have to walk through them. And there can be all kinds of stuff, and like, you know, they require some much more serious work. Yeah. And, hmm? yes? So, by choosing a better architecture, in principle, we could reduce this? Yes. You can choose, uh, you can reduce that by Choosing a better architect architecture, like, you know, if it's not stochastic tiny data, like for an amplitude, for instance, for an amplitude over phase space, right? I mean, okay, you have a certain uncertainty, like, you know, how, you, how well you predict this, but this is like, like, you know, this might be even machine uncertainty or your algorithm doing the amplitude. That's small. It's not, you know. There's also nothing stochastic about an amplitude over phase space, right? It's just something you calculate for every phase space point, and it involves like a very long numerical expression if it's at three loops, right? So, but there's nothing stochastic. However, your your network, like you know, like your, your amplitude might have features which, like you know, are quite extreme, going up and down, mass peaks, and so on and so forth. In which case, you need a very powerful model to, like you know, describe this all right. And if you don't have that powerful model, this is the uncertainty you get. 
right? So you can split those two. Right. Yeah. So you said that the network blocks lacks expressivity if, if this doesn't go to zero. With that could be one one source. What does it mean? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, going back to the to the, to the fit. Imagine you have a data have have a network that has data points like this, right? Um, now you like think of a fit, right? With a fit, you said, like, okay, I can probably do like some kind of an inverse law that like, gives me that. No chance that I'm going to get this right. So like you know, you have a certain minimum power of your of, of your power expansion to get this right, like that. Um, the same is true for a network. I mean, a network, like you know, is going to be sensitive typically to a certain resolution. And like you know, if you have like your very very narrow peaks, and the network tries 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 tries, tries to express that. The network will be tempted to just, like you know, basically interpolate that away and ignore that thing, if you don't tell it not to, because you know it, it gets about five points right, four points right, and this one here it doesn't matter. So, for your loss, right? I mean, so like, um, what you then need is a network that has more parameters, where like you know the network feel, feels confident to actually go to smaller resolution and all of a sudden resolve this kind of mass peak. Same fit network, same thing, really, right? I really think that, like you know, like thinking over these networks as a physicist, as, as, as a generalized fits, which, by the way, is also the great success of like you know neural net, neural net pattern densities, our famous most famous application, but right, is is always very useful, almost always. More questions? You had some. So I saw hands. Oh yeah, him. Yes. Uh, what happens if you have a, a twofold degeneracy in some kind of um, question here for, uh, it was like, you know, what have, what a two-fold degeneracy, you mean that you like, um, what do you mean by degeneracy? In a, a two-dimensional plane, I could do y top tuning for Higgs to group the get plus and minus solutions, for example. So that you, like, yeah, so like, you know, think of a two-dimensional plot here, two, two parameters, you like, you solve something, like, or you have a phase-based distribution, and you have essentially like equivalent structures here and here, and nothing else anywhere there. Yeah. Um, same thing. Um, depends on the setup of, of your hyperparameter of the network. I mean, what, uh, with any network will typically get one of those right, even if it's not very complex. To get the second one right, the network needs to be two, two things. First of all, it needs to be powerful enough to actually encode it. And secondly, the training needs to be like, you know, force it to actually do both. Because, you know, this is called a mode collapse if it doesn't, right? Um, so, like, you know, it might just, um, just be happy with one of them. Um, this is, uh, think of the uh, KL divergence, right? The KL divergence included a sampling over, like, you know, points and then evaluating the difference of the functions. If your sampling chooses at some point to ignore that, from then on, the network will, will, will just work on this, uh, on this one. Um, so it's two things. You need to, for, for, for uh, in, in that sense, if you have, it's a, quite a challenge. You, you need the network to be expressive enough and you need, you need the network to be, um, to be, um, to, to also be trained to force, to use its expressivity to actually do that function. But then this specific systematic or stochastic error is dominated by the true minimum, and then you always get the Oh, so he's asking, like, you know, what happens with these uncertainties, like, you know, um, in these kind of cases? Well, um, let me just, like, postpone that question to about, like, three minutes, and then we have it. Yeah? So, um, what I want to say, like, you know, okay, now I have the network. Let me come, come back to your question. Thanks. So, like, you know, what we learn here is, is two things. Like, you know, we have the predictive uncertainty that, by the way, has nothing to do with theta, right? Um, right? I mean, this is, like, you know, defined even in the set limit from theta zero. And this here is a function of theta. So, what I can, the first thing I do is I can actually split these two uncertainties and say, like, this here is something I learn over theta space. So, I can define my BNN here as a network that maps first of all, x space and then theta space onto a two-dimensional output. The first one is defined here. This is this a bar that depends on theta, right? And x, let me just write this now explicitly here. And the second object that I can write down is sigma stock, but now of theta and x. I'll call this model, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, your sigma, it's not the predictive one that's important of theta of x, right? So these uh, uh, two objects are defined at the level of, in the, uh, as a function in theta space, in weight space, and a function in x. So your network, 
will learn, if you put this in the right, like, you know, in the, in the loss function, um, um, if you, like, include this, it will learn that contribution and that contribution, right? So um, you can, let me just write the loss function that gives, him, gives, gives me that first. So now I'm repeating the loss function, and I'm going from here to the very, to the very end and making this, like, Gaussian, so, like, you know, it's a little bit simpler. So now my loss function now, if I know these kind of two things, looks like this. It has a d, d theta, and has a q of theta, but let, let me indicate with an index mu and sigma that now I'm, I want these q's to be Gaussian. Um, I can certainly try that. Um, if it doesn't work, I can modify that function to a, something that works better. But like the simplest shot that we always have is, um, is Gaussian. And then you have like, you take your training data points, xj, and then you have this likelihood here, or log likelihood, and um, yeah, let, let's assume that this log, log likelihood also has a Gaussian distribution. If that log likelihood has a, has a Gaussian distribution, it comes with an uncertainty. I can only write this down if I have an uncertainty, right? A likelihood, log likelihood needs an uncertainty, chi squared, right? Needs a sigma. But you know, I have a sigma, it's that. That sigma I can use for that, right? So here I would have like an A bar. Um, this is like, you know, what's coming out here of theta j. Uh, minus a bar training data or truth squared. This is the numerator of a log likelihood ratio, right? And divided by twice the sigma um, here. At this certain point in phase space, and I call this stock, we are all like model if the data is not stochastic. It's, it's a non, it's a systematic. I should, should, call that, have called, should have called that systematic at the time. Um, when you in introduce the sigma into the Gaussian or likelihood ratio, normally um, the term, like, you know, we never mentioned here, um, um, we never mentioned is normalization, but remember if you write down the Gaussian, sigma appears in the normalization term. So we better get that with us, take that with us um, into the formula. So this has a log of sigma model, or like a stochastic j of theta. And this is all like independent on x, as I said. Um, Sigma, okay, this is the two terms. And then the second one is the KL divergence, and I told you that's going to be Gaussian plus, and I wrote the formula down for you. I just want you to see this formula. One sigma Q squared minus sigma P squared plus mu Q minus mu sigma, and uh, mu P whole thing squared divided by two sigma P squared plus log sigma P over sigma q. So that's my loss function of my network now. So this is actually what we do in practice. So this is our, like, you know, nicely written. I mean, like, you know, this is like, you know, like, you know, the physics results are always nice when you write them down, like, e equals mc squared, and there's no index, and there, it's a representation invariant and generally true. And then you write this down, and then, like, you actually write down the formula. The worst example is the sign model Lagrangian. I mean, the worst example in the world is like the Sun model Lagrangian, where you like, you know, can write this super elegantly or even just talk about it. Then we talk about it, and, and then you write it down at like fills pages, like once you have all the indices in. Same thing here, right? I mean, this is our loss function, nice and pretty. This is our loss function reality. This is literally how it appears in the code. For amplitude training. So what you see here is that two things. First of all, you have a model uncertainty over phase space that you can track. You know it's a function of the theta and the theta and of theta and, and, and x, and you can sample it, and then you get this one. In addition, you have this like you know, the sampling step over theta, right? You can do that. You can calculate this, but there's also this uncertainty left here that I cannot actually write, like you know, as a theta-dependent counterpart. So the second thing I need to do is I also has to have to compute the sigma pred, and the sigma pred requires now explicit sampling over my over over theta like distribution in the network. So I have two uncertainties that my network constructs. This one here, the model of stochastic uncertainty that enters the loss function, the Gaussian in that case, approximate a loss function, and then the second one that gives you the statistical uncertainty. And let me like a typical plot when you plot these will look like this. You can erase that, but we don't know and we need any more. So um, the typical plot is, imagine you, well, I know, you calculate, you know, amplitudes, you do something, um, um, and you estimate, like, you know, the uncertainty of your network output sigma taught here um, as a function of training data. A 
a monotraining data, right? What you typically see is that you have like, you know, two uncertainties. Like, you know, first of all, you have the total uncertainty. And because it adds in quadrature, the total uncertainty goes like this. Right? Why? Well, because you have a statistical uncertainty that goes down, and you have a systematic uncertainty that doesn't go down. So if you now split it, so this is sigma tau, if you now split this into a statistical uncertainty, what typically look, it happens is, or the predictive here, is this, you see that? And this function here, like, you know, it, it typically needs to wiggle a little bit and then hits it here. This is sigma, what we call model or stochastic. So it's a systematic uncertainty. And these are literally the plots you can make with these, with, with these networks. So what you look at, this is like, you know, the uncertainty on a tagger, uncertain, an, an amplitude estimation on any, anything you want. You, you always make these kind of plots at the end. Total uncertainty split into a systematic and a statistical um, uh, uh, contribution. Why is that interesting? Well, from a practical perspective, it's interesting because if you just look at your network and you don't have any error bar, right, you notice it works so well, but, but not good enough. And first question was, well, what, do, what do I need to do? And what you normally do in machine learning is you panic, you change everything, like, you know, the day, training data side, hyperparameters, preprocessing everything at a time, like, you know, do the mother of all, like, hyperparameter scans and also put in 10, 10, 10 times as much training data and where things get better, right? Now here, this is actually a tool where you can say, like, I need to work on this or that. For instance, what we typically find is number of training data points for a lot of applications is really a small uncertainty, which is probably related to the fact that we always never like, work with less than a million, right? I mean, in particle physics. But like, you know, this is really typically not big. Um, it's also actually very hard to drive to zero. In principle, that would go to zero. I should say this should go to zero, but it never does. It goes very slowly to zero. Um, and then you have model uncertainty, stochastic uncertainty, and then you play with the network, and you see like, what gets better. Like, you know, you make the network a little bigger. Then it's, uh, then could, it's a model uncertainty. Or well, stochasticity, like, you know, you play with it. The easiest way of t testing stochasticity, to stochasticity is basically add some noise to the data and, like, you know, see if, like, you know, the thing here, noise, and see if that behaves like that, and then you have a stochastic problem. Right? I mean, so like, you know, these kind of, you can now, now, can, now can play with the data, pre-processing everything in a very well-defined manner. You can improve your network there where it lacks precision or power. Right? So this is like, you know, one opportunity, like, you know, you, with the Bayesian, you can, for which you can use the Bayesian networks to really make a difference to your network training. So is it hard to do network Bayesian networks? Well, depends. Like, you know, all the things, like, you know, that you need for, like, coding, they're available as standard libraries. Just have to like, change your loss function. The loss function, obviously, here is slightly more complicated with an L than an MSE, which would be just this term, right? MSE is sigma, um, and sum over j, that. That's an MSE. And now we'll have stuff here and stuff here. Um, then we have, like, you know, the well defined, like a regularization term, and have all these kind of things, right? So it's a more complicated loss function. Let me let two things about these, these, these Bayesian networks. Um, so that first one is, um, forget about like, you know, forget about the statistical stuff, forget about the sampling of theta, right? Um, just like, you know, go into the limit, deterministic network theta is just like, you know, it's not, it's, uh, uh, um, the statistical network is just um, theta zeros. So this our entire sampling goes away. That doesn't. That here becomes an L2 regularization. Right? Okay, you can write this down. So what changes, even if you go into this, the deterministic limit, is that your loss function keeps sigma stock. And you know, I, I told you, this is not going go to down, go, down, go to zero if you go to a deterministic network. So um, this loss then has a name. It's called um, a heterostatistic loss. It's also, by the way, I should say, like, oh, I just advertised, this is all like, you know, Yaringal thesis. I think it's 2016 or something like this, something ridiculously late <laughs> compared to my like, lifetime in physics. Um, any case, so, um, so like, you know, he actually wrote this down. It's like, I have never tried this. I mean, like in my group, we do Bayesian networks all the time. If anybody wants has a network that's hard and tough and doesn't want to be trained, like do me the favor, try this heterostatistic loss and let me know what it is, what comes out. Because, you know, it's something I always wanted to try. 
We always go for like, you know, the full Bayesian blast kind of thing, but like, you know, it would be really nice to try this out. And this is very simple because then you really just, all you need to do is you change your loss function in your library, but like, you know, there's no sampling step, step about theta involved here anymore. This works for a regular network. So the network now, even in the absence of theta, still learns two functions, an amplitude and the uncertainty. Yes? This one here. Yes. This is the, renormal, the normalization of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Gaussian. The normalization has one over root, like it has, it has the two pi's I'm dropping, root sigma in the pre, pre or one over root sigma, and then it has this e to the minus term. Yeah? Don't forget this because otherwise it won't work. I think that's a general rule for life in physics. Okay. <laughs> Make sure you have it so everything is right, so things work. Yeah? Okay, so you can use this um, this um, this um, this, uh, this setup to also, like you know, generally for a regular network, learn your target function and some kind of an uncertainty. Obviously, the statistical uncertainty, or depends on the training da data size, is going to vanish from that because you no, know, this is the this is this term that you need to sample over. They don't have that anymore. But for instance, model expressivity should actually work. Now, something that we did recently, yes. Yeah. Well, we have values of weights after each training epoch yes. that are set. Yes. So how is the sampling realized? The, the weights are sampled? Or yeah. So what happens is every weight, now think of a net, this network as two networks, like two pieces of information. For every net parameter, network parameter, you have some kind of a weight um, and you have some kind of like, you know, an, an, an uncertainty, so on, mu and sigma here. Sorry. Yeah? And so what happens is you, you literally just like, you know, if you want just, you know, your deterministic approximation, you can just like, you know, look for the means and just like, you know, take all of those like the network parameters at their mean value. Then you get some central value if you want. And now what you do, you sample through your network. You basically like, you know, let your, let your network parameters float. And this only works because networks are so fast that you can evaluate the network. Like once it's trained, evaluation is fast. You evaluate it, I don't know, 100 times or something like this, order of magnitude. Um, and then you get this, this variation. And all of these, I, sh I should say, by the way, all of these network weights in this approximation we are using, they're all Gaussian and uncorrelated. So this A bar corresponds to the mean? Yeah. Well? It's effectively the mean, yeah. So Think with a deterministic uh, network, we would just ignore the sigma and just take A, yeah. a bar value. Yeah. And in practice, what you can do is you can just also, for like all the, of the theta distributions, you can just like, you know, take the mean, um, and then run the network through the means, and then should get, give you the same. But both about means and sigma. The trick is that you learn both of them in parallel, so they know about each other. Yes. Yeah. Um, in the case of overfitting, uh, do you expect both the predictive and the stochastic uncertainty to be zero, or can it also happen there that you are, in the case of overfitting, and have non-zero or sizable? I've never seen them go away in practice. Um, so I think what you'll see, but what we do see is that the, the statistical uncertainty actually you see, you, you see that go to become very small. However, overfitting would like, you know, mean like, you know, that, that goes, go, becomes very, very small and then something funny happens with it. We never see that. What we typically see is that the, 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 the sigma pred actually decreases much more slowly than you think it should. So in the sense that, like, that's, I think it's along the same lines I said before, told, told you before, yesterday, what this after, in the, what was in the question session, we typically don't actually, we don't see overfitting in most of our, in most our serious overfitting in most of our applications because as particle physicists, we, are, we, we maintain such tight control of our networks that like, you know, the entire setup prevents crazy overfitting to begin with. But like, you know, yeah. Usually the gain of additional training data is a little bit, um, a letdown. It's a little bit disappointing when you look into it. So you could be in overfitting and still have sizable No, I, I, I'd argue that all the networks that I have run in my life, like, you know, as particle physicists, none of them ever, none of them ever got into overfitting. As a matter of fact, this amplitude network, I recently asked our students, like, you know, can you please do something that's totally crazy and overfit? And you make, make that figure for me, like the, the loss here. So this is trained as a test, right? Right? 
They try it, doesn't work. You don't get there. Why? Because the, net, the networks with the like, regularization, everything we put, we put in, and the implicit bias are so constrained that actually the worst you can reach is this. So we, we never have that problem in reality, um, in my personal research group life. <laughs> yeah? Yes? If I knew, um, I mean, certainly, like all the networks we try are heavily regularized, right? Um, uh, I can't tell you. I really, I, I don't know. I like, you know, it's something. It's we just like, you know, a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks ago, we thought about like, you know, what? Why don't we like, you know, do something like, you know, crazy overfitting, and then like, you know, we do double descent, right? Um, and we, <laughs> I wanted to try double descent, really. Like, we can talk about this in the break. Thing is, I didn't get, we didn't get the starting point, which means a crazy overfitting network. We just didn't manage. It's, I, I guess it's because deep down, particle physicists are control freaks. Even theorists like me, we are still control freaks. Maybe like, we should ask a cosmologist. <laughs> They're more open-minded characters. I, like, I don't know, I can't tell you. <laughs> no. Nothing overfits, crap. Okay, so that's the one thing. The other thing I wanted to just show, to tell you briefly, I talked about this, like, you know, how, what, what happens if I have an amplitude? I drew this picture before. Um, what if I, have an, if, I, if I have an amplitude space, X here, um, phase space, and I have amplitudes here, and like, you know, my data, training data point looks like this. This is actually real life, it happens all the time. This is a collinear splitting of two jets, you know this. Amplitude explodes. Could also be a mass peak. Amplitude explodes, right? So my network, I do not want my network to just like screw around here and then basically ignore that and do a, like a mildly accommodating growing here. I want my network to go bam up here. Now, how can I, can, how can I achieve that? Actually, in this language, it's absolutely trivial. Now, think fit, right? What do I need to do? I basically, in the fit, I would assign this measurement a very small error bar and tell the network go through that, right? I mean, this is like what we are doing in the fit, and the network will hit this. And if this error bar is actually artific artificially small, then, um, 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 then you basically interpolate, right? I mean, you have an interpolation network. So can I do the same thing here? And the answer is yes, I can totally do that. How would I do this in practice? Um, there's different ways you can do that, but like in you know, one way, you could actually, for those, um, for those points, you can like, choose sigma stock to be very small. But then I need to like, interfere with the training of the network. I don't want to do this because sigma stock appears here and here and blah, blah, blah. So I don't want to do that. I want the network to learn this. So what I can instead do is I can say, well, I have an uncertainty estimate. So I can, at the level of the training data, I can say, look, my variable here, which is nothing but the pull variable, like you know, how many sigmas am I away right, from my prediction, if that becomes very big, like you know, look at those data points, again, more carefully. This is, anybody who has ever done a boosted decision tree, this is boosting, right? And we basically tell, look again. Well, this is how the boosting of a boosted decision tree works in principle. So like, you know, what we did recently is, um, we basically um, took a network, and instead of just like, you know, having the data points, give a da the data point here some kind of a artificial multiplicity. And basically say, okay, I can only do this, I cannot do this for generative networks, but I can do this for like regression networks. So I can say, like, you know, if the pull at a certain point here is bad, so the network learn function here is very many sigmas away from the from the truth, like you know, increase that number. Give it five or whatever. Right? So I can force my network to be more precise. This is something I can only do if I have the error bar, because you know, otherwise I would have to say, well, if your prediction is further away than 3.178, please try again. That makes no sense, right? So what I need is I need a, re a, a reference scale, so I basically say, um, if, my, if, if the, the network, you have determined your uncertainty. If you're so many uh, sigmas away, clearly by your own judgment, you're wrong. So like, you know, try again. And that works. That leads, leads to, an improved, um, to an improved training. Yeah. So, like you know, these like you know, the, um, networks 
Bayesian networks or networks with uncertainties, they're actually they're great play, a great playground. Um, I think, honest to God, like, you know, you can ask my group, like, whenever we do something, of course, like, in the raw stuff with the standard net network, and then something always goes wrong, like it always does, and, like, my first reply to everybody is, okay, make it Bayesian. I want to see what's happening. I want to understand what's happening. I want to understand what's going on. Make it Bayesian. Let me know. So, like, you know, this is, like, you know, especially for the people who actually do the real work in the audience, like, you know, make it, make it Bayesian, see what's going wrong, then solve your problem. Don't just, like, you know, run around the network from all sides and, like, change everything it is and then do the mother of all, as I said, of the mother of all hyperparameter fits. It's not that the mother of all hyperparameter fits doesn't work. It usually does work at some point, right, because this is the power of a CPU and GPU. But, um, well, I would say... Um, there's a difference between, like, you know, systematically learning something or, like, learning through intuition by, like, you know, putting a textbook... Um, under your pillow. <laughs> so it, it helps. OK, so that was Bayesian networks, my favorite ones. Networks like, you know, that has a loss function you can, you can derive, that have like, you know, uncertainty and, and, uh, estimates. I think really, like, you know, if a particle phys or an LHC physicist had invented neural networks, I think that person would have invented Bayesian networks. And it would never bloody call them Bayesian networks, by the way. And networks were invent Bayesian networks were invented for something else, by the way. Um, they were invented for like inference, for measuring stuff. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in detail because I, because I think it's fair to say they don't work for that. Or it's actually fairer to say it's never like what the, what's the like you know, the measurement of don't work. There are better better ways of doing that nowadays. And we come to that in my very last lecture on like you know conditional. Generative networks, they work better. So nobody uses, in particle physics, Bayesian networks for inference. Don't. There's better tools. You can, we can do better inference than that. However, we can use them for uncertainty measures. And by the way, just one, one thing I want to say. Bayesian networks are super old. I think invented in 1991. Right? And it took the world, I don't know, until whatever, 2016, like, you know, decades, to figure out that you can use them for inference as they were in intended to, and at some point, that you can use them for uncertainty measurement. And by the way, the person who figured this out was a graduate student at the time. Just saying. Like, you know, I don't want to like, you know, put a bar here, but like, you know, jump over this, please. Yes. You're right. Um, you can. It's a you play with the train data. Like, you know, it, it's, very, it's very difficult, right? I mean, in our case, this was an application where we knew there were no statistical crazy iron fluctuations. Um, though I would argue that if it's a statistical fluctuation, um, you, you should still be able to, like, you know, like, you know, deter, like, you know, see, like, you know, this by the arrow bar. That the, like, you know, if the network knows there's stochasticity in the data, um, it should, if they have a statistical fluctuation in line with, like, you know, the general statistical fluctuations, the network will, um, will so the sigma stock is actually going to accommodate that, and you will, the pull of that number, of, of that point, will not be very large. I hope. Fingers crossed. Try it. We haven't. It's like, you need to, I'm telling you stuff that we have just published. I mean, this is, like, you know, brand new off the press. This is nothing. Like, sounds so trivial when I talk about it, but, like, you know, it's brand new. Yeah. Is there a complication from a look elsewhere effect? Oh, look elsewhere effect. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> let's postpone that question to like when we talk about inference. It's that is a that is a problem, like you know, like you know, our, our look elsewhere effect. However, it might also be when you think about inference methods, I would argue that like the look elsewhere effect is a solution to a problem that we particle physicists have only generated, that if you do the right inference, probably never appears if you start doing things like, you know, like, you know I mean, the look elsewhere effect, if you think about in our statistical treatment, is, 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 is a solution. Right? Like, you know, we basically, it's, it's a way to accommodate the fact that we'll do a lot, doing a lot of analysis in parallel which are strictly not uncorrelated. So the idea would be if you, if you obtain a network and you do a proper inference and you do it all in one run, there's no need for no look elsewhere effect analysis. However, yeah, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on 
And like you know, by, to my second, the topic that I wanted to cover here, and that's classification. Um, so the second one, so the first one was basically networks with uncertainty, the second one is classification. Um, okay. What's classification? Think about like, you know, the standard like, you know, neural network application that everybody has like always tried to do like machine learning in particle physics and that's jet tagging. Everybody does jet tagging because it's easy, it's simple. The data format is, 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 is simple. It's not very complicated in terms of the physics. Like, you know, you can do this. So like, you know, in this, like, you know, I have a QCD jet. Is it a quark or gluon or is it a top quark? Simple question, simple answer, right? So what do I want here for my network? I still have the classification network. I give it my kind of information on the jet, jet kinematics, and I map this to a network function um, f theta of x, which to first approximation has to be between 0 and 1. And ideally, it also gonna have, it's also going to have a probability output. output. So the answer would be the network gives you a number between 0 and 1, and that number corresponds to the probability of this object being either a top quark or a QCD jet. And I'm not doing Bayesian networks at this stage. You can actually Bayesianize that. We did this, but like, you know, just to explain like, you know, what we're doing. So this is like, you know, the classification task. First thing is make sure that F theta, like the output is between 0 and 1. Well, that's not super hard. You basically, in your last layer, you, know, you, you, you do like a sigmoid function or something. You basically do a transformation where you take the unbounded space of like, you know, weights and you, like, you know, map this on a bounded space. Um, this is, which is between zero and one, and there's a whole lot of different ones, and, and uh, typically people do use a sigmoid for that. I don't want to talk about this. This is simple textbook stuff, right? Um, the more interesting question is, if I want this thing to be a probability output, um, what's my loss function? I mean, clearly, not every network that I train, for instance, on an MSE is going to have a probabilistic output. Like, why should it? Right? I mean, there's nothing probabilistic about an MSE. Why should out of nowhere my output be, should be probabilistic, right? That's, it's not. It shouldn't be, and it is not. So let's think about this. this like, you know, how, how would I like, um, think, about, um, think about a classification? Uh, the classification has essentially, um, I mean, in your X space, for instance, um, your classification um, uh, relies on, again, probabilistic to probability distribution, right? So you have probability, probability distributions for something being a signal, and you get this right, and you have probability distribution for something to be in a background, right? And for both of those, you have some probability distribution that's implicitly encoded in the training data. Let's we call this P data. Like it's a function of X here. I give it a second index S, and I have a probability distribution that I want to put into my, um, into my network, this is going to be the model of that distribution. And when the network is well trained, these are identical. Same thing, background distributions, P model, background. So there's two things, I got, three things I can say. First of all, if this, these things, the network is well trained, that data and model should always be the same for signal and for background. Second, P signal with a probability should be 1 minus P background. So they should add to 1. That's because they are probabilities. Right? The third thing, there was a really important third thing. Ah, yes. Niemann Pearson lemma. So if you want to tell apart the signal from the background the best possible way, right, then I know from the Niemann Pearson lemma. Pearson lemma, um, that my network output or whatever my discriminator is, the discriminator should like go like the likelihood ratio of signal over background. This is math or statistics. The Pearson lemma says like you know the optimal way of to distinguish two hypotheses by some definition, or definition of optimal in terms of um, type two and one and two, type two error. But like the optimal way of doing that is through the likelihood ratio. So here is it, like, you know, here is like, again, here, network, jump over that, please. If my network, you know, um, is as good as it says, is it says it is, it better, like, you know, reproduces the Niemann-Pearson lemma. So the 
um, the, 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 the function that the network should eventually learn is going to be the likelihood ratio. I know this from the Newman Pearson lemma. So I can use these pieces of information to construct my loss function real fast. Not super, super difficult. So like, you know, I take a classification. OK, and what, I, what do I do? My network training um, means these, thing ha these things have to, start, have to agree. That has to agree with that, and that has to agree with that, right? I already know how that works. And that is my loss function has to compare those two distributions as distributions. And we learned the best way of comparing two distributions is the KL divergence. OK, so here is DKL. And um, P data. And this is now signal and background distribution. So actually, model J, J equals signal and background. If that is true, if I minimize that, then my network will have encoded the signal and background distributions entirely, like you know, in its entire range um, here of x, such that this corresponds to that and that corresponds to here. Right? So, OK. What I have, I have implicitly used that I can like, try to like, you know, form, formulate this in terms of the Neiman Pearson lemma, because you know that the KL divergence is the sampled likelihood log of the likelihood ratio. Right? So here, this one here is the log likelihood ratio. So this means Neiman Pearson is OK. I'm implicitly using that, right? I mean, the fact that I'm using the KL divergence actually is motivated by the, well, it's first of all motivated the simplest solution, and it has the advantage that Neiman Pearson lemma actually traces. The only thing is, um, you remember the KL divergence is not symmetric. I can pick one or the other. I picked one here, and I'll show you that that makes sense. You try the other one, it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, that doesn't give me the right results. So, like, you know, I have to pick this ordering. OK, now I can actually simplify that. I simplify, no. I can actually insert what the KL divergence means, and then we simplify it. OK, so this is like, you know, remember, the KL divergence is nothing but sampling. So this is the log here of um, P. Let me call this like D, and then signal, and then minus here for the signal log PMS, sampled over the first argument P data. Signal, right? This is nothing but the definition of this KL divergence in terms of expectation values. By the way, I like the expectation values with these brackets. OK, and the second one here is the same thing for the background. So it's log P data background minus log P model background over P data background sampled. Yeah? OK, now this is a loss function. And now I check like, which of these terms have anything to do with theta, like you know, the network I'm training. And um, that tells you here, now you see here, I did something, I did th something right by choosing that p data as the first argument, because that simplifies the argument a lot, because p data has nothing to do with theta. Like, there is no network, like, you know, um, the, 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 no a parameter impact on, this number of, on these distributions. So they have nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, um, with my, my log network training. So here I'm fine, here I'm fine. Um, then p data here, yeah, I mean, nothing to do. Sample p data, uh, following p data, that's nothing to do with the model, right? So I can forget about that, and I can as, as well forget about this factor here. So I can simplify my, my life by just log, removing all the constants of the theta p data. And then I have mi minus log p model background over p data background plus constants of theta. OK. Um, let's write this out, because it'll, like, re it'll tell us something, like, you know, remind us something that, like, you know, some of you might have seen before. Now, think of this, like, oh, as a, like, forget about this, like, you know, the, the like, you know, sampling here. Like, well, make, make the, let's make that exp explicit. Like, you know, we have a data set X here I showed you. So how does that look? Well, it looks like summing over all my data points X, however, like, you know, they're defined. This is, like, you know, configurations of my jets. Um, and then ha I have the first term here is, Sampled following p data, s 
And then here have a log P model S. That's this term here. And then you have minus pulled out plus P data B times log P model B. OK, now um, look at this, and especially look at, like, look at this formula in the case where your, actually, your training has worked, which means that data and model for S are, about, are the same, roughly the same. Data for background and model are, are background are the same. So your function that you're like, um, minimizing here is the sum over your data points, um, P signal, log P signal, plus P background, log P background. Anyone? Remembering that term? Fitting people? This is um, called the cross entropy. I mean, this is like, you know, if you fit some kind of variable, like, you know, a variable, like, you know, standard classification variable, this is nothing but the cross entropy. So I'm not going to, like, you know, I don't need the fact that this is the cross entropy, but I can relate to, like, standard methods. This is nothing but the cross entropy. So um, historically, when you read the machine learning papers, they said we're using the cross entropy, cross entropy loss function. That is actually correct. This is the, the cross entropy. It's a little bit, in my opinion, like, you know, I have this, like, you know, idea with the likelihood distributions here in mind. Like, you know, I'm, if you want Kyle Cranmer trained. And um, so I like this in terms of, of the likelihoods. I don't really give a damn about the cross entropy, but, like, you know, this is just scale leverages of likelihood distributions. But, you know, it is a cross entropy at the end of the day, right? It's just, you know, I wouldn't have introduced it. Uh, in the first set of lecture notes, in the er early on, I, I'm, I like introduced the cross entropy, and then like you know, I decided to just like you know, for, go for the likelihoods right away. Okay, there's another thing we can we, we can check here. Um, take that distribution, um, and just take this. Now, um, insert my condition that p signal is one minus p background. Eventually, if everything is trained right. So if you think it's trained right and like, you know, the probabilities actually are probabilities, then this is not encoded here, right? I mean, I also need to, to take into account that P signal is one minus P background, right? So like, you know, to put this in PS plus PB equals one, then your loss function classification, how does this go? It becomes minus sum over X. Um, okay, model class. Yeah, so the first term, uh, let me just write this out here. So this is um, P data signal my log P model signal here plus, and now I'm inserting this P background is one minus P data signal times log P one minus P model signal. Just like this, I just inserted this formula here. Um, and you actually can pull this, like, you know, under one big fat log. Like, you know, pull this in here, pull this in here. So this becomes a x here. And then you pull this, write this as a logarithm here. And inside the log, um, you have two terms. This is a sum, right? So this is a, it becomes a product. And this a PD becomes the power of a PM. So like, you know, so you have a P model signal to the power of P data signal times the same thing for 1 minus P model signal to the power of 1 minus P data, P data signal, bracket closed. Looks a little complicated at this stage, right? I mean, that formula, it's not obvious why I'm doing that. Well, Go back, and like, you know, in my lecture notes, or, like, you know, go back, and back, back in your, your mind and, like, you know, replace P data signal here with X, right? And then replace that one here with rho. And then you have a Bernoulli, Bernoulli distribution. This is the probability distribution that you get if you, like, you know, have, like, two, like, you know, outcomes uh, two possible outcomes, top jet and Q versus QCD jet, and your, um, your probability distribution has, a, has, an, has an expectation value rho. So what you see here is that my function that I've written down here actually fulfills, like, you know, I started with probability distribution or likelihoods, Neiman Pearson lemma, put this in, 
got the cross entropy, right? So like, you know, I can I relate to the standard like classification task. You look into it, you write it out, you also see what you really do is, if you like manipulate it right, what you're doing is your, your, your classification um, here minimizes the logarithm, forget about the fact that the logarithm is smooth, right? Um, of a uh, Bernoulli distribution, um, of a Bernoulli probability distribution, but sort of as a likelihood, right? I mean, this is all, all um, classification trying to like, you know, construct construct your, your model such that it um, agrees with the data. This is still, still the training. So what you do is like, you know, here, standard thing, like, you know, what you're doing is like, you know, yes, you're constructing a model. It, it'll fulfill the Niemann Pearson um, lemma. The outcome here is like, you know, just like, you know, uh, optimizing um, the Bernoulli distribution as, term, uh, as, a, as it thought of as, as, a, as a likelihood, right? So, yeah, does everything, right? So all the statistical part, like, you know, cross entropy and stuff, like, just comes out of this very simple argument. You have two distributions. You need to get them right. We know, like, time-honored machine learning, KL divergence. Remember, we picked that because it's simple and easy. You write this. The only thing, the only choice you have to make is, like, you know, not do this the other way around because then nothing comes out right. So, like, you know, that's the only choice you have. The only choice is, like, you know, we sample following the data. And that we need to make this argument. And now I have my loss function for a classification network. Derived just from the same likelihood arguments that we always derive our loss functions from. No, like, you know, whatever, like, you know, um, uh, hand waving, like, statistics argument, just likelihoods. Okay. I promise I talk a little bit about, about networks now. Um, how do we classify stuff? Let me just like, you know, sit and like, we, we talk a little bit about what, 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 what would I like, you know, do with such a classification network? Um, well, I mean, the thing is, for, I guess, purely sociological reasons and like, you know, for reasons of like, you know, making things simple, like, you know, a field like particle physics, a bunch of people will just agree on a task that, that we play with. And this is like, you know, you have to give like, you know, credit to the, the boost community, so the boosted objects community and like, you know, with their conference and stuff, um, that like, you know, they defined our perfect task. The perfect task that we're always looking at is jet tagging. So how does a jet look? Jet tagging task. Specifically, my favorite one is top versus QCD. Why? because it's the easiest of all taking tasks you can imagine, right? It's like, it's the simplest one, right? So you want to, what you want is you have a gluon and it splits into all kinds of garbage here and makes it a jet. And you want to compare that to a top, which you guys, so to a B and a W. The B like does all kinds of crazy stuff and the W goes to two jets and they also do crazy stuff and that's another jet. And you want to tell them apart, right? So I wrote down, my classification as x map to f theta of x. So this one here is my classification task. The first question, and that is the basic question you can ask here, is, OK, people have done this. I've done this. I don't know for how long I've done this top tagging, like, you know, on complicated algorithms kind of crap, like, you know, stuff. I mean, really complicated. And by the way, used by Atlas and CMS, like, they all had their top, top tagging algorithms. So what you do is, normally, you take all the information about the about your, about your jets, you construct a bunch of variables. Invariant masses between two correlators, all kinds of stuff. And then you do a, at the end of the day, you do some kind of crazy algorithm, and then, and then, and then you do a multivariate analysis, and then you get some kind of result. And that's dependent on your algorithm and the power of your multivariate analysis. This is, um, yeah, result is more or less good, let's say. Right? So um, the fundamental question here, though, is, why should I go through, these, all, through all these variables and the BDT? Like, I have never actually said what this x is. So let's make x some representation of the jets. And this is like, you know, I think this is the idea of Ben Nachman originally. He said, OK, like, you know, this is how the and that C detector looks. Right? So the, you know the variables, like you know this one here is the azimuthal angle, as it's called phi, and this one here is the rapidity P0 eta, right? So what people, what, what Ben Nachman, I think, also as a student did, 
he said, like, okay, um, take one of these, like, you know, pieces of the colorimeter, look in, from inside outside, then the way a jet will, oh, make this bigger, then a jet will look like this. So here's my piece of the colorimeter, look from the outside, and okay, um, what does the jet look like? Like this, maybe? So a jet has, actually, at the, at the resolution of Atlas and CMS, any, anything between like 20 and 100 hits in the colorimeter. And we know that jets depend on the jet algorithms are also approximately round, so like, you know, they actually look like this. Um, okay, now, if you think of a ref jet representation like, uh, the, uh, um, like this, then what you have actually done, you have um, written uh, yourself, like, you know, your jet image. Images are cool, why? Because you can do machine learning without actually doing machine learning work, because the literature and the tool, the, the set of tools ready made for like image recognition is practically infinite. Like, you know, this is a huge amount of work machine learning community has been done on image recognition. So the idea is let's just run like, you know, one of these, like, run some of these image recognition algorithms over our jet images. Okay, what do I do? Yeah, um, <laughs> the problem is. Um, these, these images, like, you know, these, like, you know, points here, like, you know, they, what well, they sit somewhere. For tops, they probably have three prongs, you know. Um, one, two, three. For QCD, they have one, maybe two, right? So you can, I mean, look into the lecture notes, you'll find, like, the average of, like, you know, um, QCD jets and top jets, 10,000 of them, fine. Yes? Can you say for a prong? Prong is just a... Um, uh, like a main, a main direction where, like, you know, a cluster, where you have a cluster of uh, activity. So it's just, yeah, clusters. A prong is a cluster. Oh, yeah, that's QCD people, like, you know, hadron, hadronization people call this prongs, call it subcluster. Okay, so how do I analyze, like, you know, these kind of, these kind of objects? Like, you know, what do people do? And, like, you know, I'll just go very fast through some of these, like, networks. The first one is, um, think of, like, an image, like, this, you know, these are all, all these Im images are typically pixels, right? Um, so what, are, what, what, do I, what do I do, can I do for this, for, the, for such an image? Well, what I can do is I can try, I have like certain patterns, like at soon I have a pattern, like, you know, I have patterns which like, you know, go off diagonal. The way I would find them is I essentially, I take a filter, three by three or something, right? and you run it over, over the image. And your filter is going to be um, encoding the information. So like you have a filter, xij is the position of like the center of the filter. Um, and what you do in the network, remember we had this dense network, what you're doing is you're one, walking through your through your image here, and every, every time you walk through your image, you update your, like, your, filter, your filter structure. Because you want to combine this information with that information, right? And you see, if I put a filter on that and on that, like, you know, it's going to give, like, you know, a comma that has simple, simple, similar structure. So what you do is you run over, like, you know, your filter variables, and this is R and S, and your filter is called W here, and you run the, over this I plus R, J plus S. That here is X to x prime, there's also plus b, whatever. Well, and then strictly speaking, you do the ReLU of that, of x ij prime. Yeah. So what you do here is you keep updating your filter. The trick with this filtering, filter, with these filters is, um, you see here, my w and my b, they're missing the argument x, and that's the entire point of those filters. Your, your filters don't actually depend on the, on the, on the like, you know, position, right? So the filter should learn from that, 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 that. those positions. They should all learn the, learn the same thing. So it'll add the information it learns from that position and from that position and from that position and from that position. So the filter keeps learning structures which, like, you know, appear in different places of our, of, of, of our image, right? And so this is exactly what you do. You basically train your network, your network parameters now for the, these are things that are convolutional networks. Um, so these are filters. They're non-local. 
and they define so-called convolu so convolution networks. No, networks, or CNN. And now, you can run these filters um, over, over your data images, and you encode quark jets, like quark and gluon jets and top jets in a certain like, amount of, like, you know, in these filters. I mean, what do I expect? Well, these things just have more prongs. So, like, probably the, this, this filter here is probably relatively ha happy to just have one big fat central entry in, in the filter, uh, whereas this one here will, have, will see an actual structure, is my best guess. I don't know. I mean, look at this, like, you know, you can, you can look, look at all of these kind of filters, but, like, you know, what you can do here. Um, No, this is, there's no jet finding. This is just calorimeter hits. There's nothing a jet algorithm. The only thing you need, you need some kind of algorithm to draw the circle or make the box around it. So you need, some, yes, you're right. You need, you need a jet algorithm to decide here's a box with a jet. And once you have the, 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 the you just look at the calorimeter entries. These are just colored pixels where, or like whatever, pixels with a number and the number is the energy, energy deposition. Could be a transverse momentum, could be the energy. That's the colorimeter output. And then you run this, uh, these, uh, these standard CNNs. And you train these on uh, we train, well, I mean, we train them on Prithia because I don't ha get my hands on, on, on actual data, but I'm, I am, like, I, like, I'm just working with, like, you know, Atlas experimental friends to try, try to do this, like, you know, at least on full simulation, and then you will, do, eventually, you want to train this on data, or full sim, whatever, like, you know, serves your purpose. It depends a little bit, like, you know, on, you see, if I, train on full sim and apply to data, I get an, a generalization error, right? If I train it on data and apply to other parts of the data, like, you know, I, get, I might get, I get some kind of a bias. So now the question is, you decide what's better for your analysis. But how can you train on data? Because you don't know the answer, right? I do know the answer. Very good question. My data set um, here, top versus QCD, that's actually very simple. Um, how do I produce um, tops? Well, tops are almost all of them produced in TT bar, right? Just, just, just as a side remark, right? TT bar production, okay, I have two tops. Now, if I go for a sample where I, I have a, a, a leptonic top on one side, leptonic taps are relatively easy to identify, I know in the recoil to this leptonic top, there has to be another top. Make that hadronic, which is anyhow more two thirds of them, right? So then you have like a re, the recoil, you have a hadronic top. And you can even, from the lepton PT that you have triggered on, you can even infer on the, P, the, the, most, the, the PT distribution of the hadronic top. So even get a PT resolution. Um, the spoilers in this argument is single top production. So there is a certain uncertainty. So like, you know, what you typically get is probably a 90 whatever, 95, 99% pure TT bar sample. But for the QCD, you don't know if it comes from the top. QCD is everything. I mean, that's the good news about QCD is, like, you know, you're looking at a jet at the LHC um, uh, in events where there's no lepton. Yeah. <laughs> quark versus gluon is a serious problem. For quark versus gluon, you would then would need to look for ZDKs, for instance, versus, like, you know, a, uh, jets coming with a Higgs or something. Then it's, it becomes increasingly more complicated. I like my tops for that reason. <laughs> I like it simple. Yeah? So these are, like, con uh, um, the convolutional networks. Um, like, you know, I don't want to go into details about convolutional networks because they might, the, idea, the idea is very simple. The, the power of these convolutional networks is, um, the is the complexity of the network. So the number of CNN parameters, how does that scale? Well, it scales clearly with the size of the filter, right? So if you have a filter like, you know, a 3x3 three three filter, the um, number of network parameters you need, forget about, like, you know, but this B scales like, you know, filter size squared. Um, okay, so this is, we call that in the, I call this in the next filter size squared. All right, this is the filter. Now, here comes the trick. A lot of, um, a lot of neural networks do that. Sometimes, for the reason that, for example, Felix mentioned, networks get things horribly wrong. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, sometimes, they're distracted and they go off like this. It's like, you know, like, you know, a student, you're like a young student on the first research project, right? I mean, almost all of them do some, do great, but like, you know, every so often they go on the wrong, wrong direction, so they have to, the advisor has to say, yeah, that way. So the same thing is true for networks. I mean, the, the networks, sometimes they're horribly wrong. 
So we never want to rely on just one network to do stuff. Like this one here, I don't even talk about Bayesian networks. What I want to do then is I don't just want to just like run one filter. Jesus, make it 10 filters, right? I mean, just run filters, um, like, you know, a set of filters. And then you can decide if you want these filters to talk to each other or not, well, that's your choice, right? Uh, typically, these filters are also connected. So this girl goes times what I just, my, my symbol for that here in my lecture notes, the number of filters. Yeah, they're called feature maps. It is interesting, by the way, like, you know, I think the biggest hurdle in, like, all fields of science is always to learn the, the words. Um, it's just true for uh, quantum field theory, the LHC physics, and machine learning. So these things are different. Um, 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 so this is uh, individual filters. Individual filters, and this is the number of filters you're running over, right? Um, yeah, and then the second uh, thing is, of course, it's a deep network, so you don't just, like, you know, do this, like, you know, one layer, like, you know, one filter, like, you know, like, you know, going from one to the other, but like you're improving the filters in, in terms of layers, so this is the number of layers. Yeah. Why is that a good thing, this, that kind of scaling? Because think about it, filter size squared 10, right? Number of filters running parallel, if you're an amateur like me, 10, if you're professional, 100. Right. Amateur, 10, so they, we are at 100. Number of layers, of U convolution networks if you're an amateur, 10 or less. If you're a professional, way more. So for amateurs, we're talking about 10 times 10 times 10, 1,000 parameters, like, you know, typically order of magnitude, like, you know, 1,000 parameters or something. It's not like this, but, like, you know, it's, look at the, the pix number of pixels that you're, like, that, that you're mapping here, right? This is, like, you know, I don't know, 100 times 100, like, you know, and our simple jet images were a little bit 40 by 40, but typically 100 by 100, so you're talking, like, you know, 10,000. Right? I mean, so here, yeah, just one second. So the idea of this, these filters is that because they're universal, you actually describe an image with relatively small number of network parameters. This is, of course, the underlying like, assumption that those small number of network parameters are, su so are sufficient to describe everything in the image because the image kind of repeats itself. Because the image, like, think of, like, you're building cameras for cars and you're interested in what houses People, other cars, right? You're not interested in all the details. You're also not interested in the like, color of the leaves of the, of the trees and stuff like that, right? So like, you know, you're assuming that the objects that you, you care about, and in our case, these are these so-called prongs or clusters, you know, that they can be described by an effectively small number of degrees of freedom as compared to the huge number of degrees of freedom um, that an image gives you, which they do. Yes? Oh, yeah. Filter as in square, and then I put in a row, but why there is oh, it's because, like, you know, like, if, if you open your phone and you look at figure eight, so, like, you know, I have, like, you know, my network works like, you know, I have, like, an image, and I have filters, and, like, you know, I look at one filter, and I make the, it better, and, like, you know, it's better, and at some point it goes into a, into a regular network, bam, 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 and then here's the output, right? So I flattened this at some point. So here I have a successive uh, number of layers which allow me to, to build up complicate, complicated functions inside the filter, inside one filter. Right? Because remember, this is just my linearized, this is just a fine filter here. Right? There's nothing, it's not very complicated. And then the trick is that instead of, of, of like one network here, you're basically allowing here for several, and they all talk to each other. And they run in parallel. Or they might, I mean, typically, we allow them to talk to each other. So at every, la every layer has a stack of different filters. And so this is the size of the filter. This here is the, de the, the de depth of the stack of filters, and that's the number of layers. And this is like you know, standard uh, convolution networks. There's nothing any physicist invented there, right? I mean, this is all I don't know, machine learning. So, right, I mean, so this, this is the first, the first network that people did. Um, what's important is that um, in our um, representation of the data, like, you know, we kiss our theory predictions goodbye, if you think about it. Like, you know, nobody cares about a carefully crafted observable. 
Why? Because in, like, in, a, set, like, um, in a way, you tell the network, find your own representation that works best. We just give you the information. This is not quite true, though, because of, because of like, you know, we actually give the data format. And the data format does actually like, you know, produce a huge bias for a reasonable representation at the end of the day. But the data format is crucial, how like, you, know, you give it. And we'll, we'll talk about this at the beginning of the next lecture. But you know, this, at least these are kind of the classification networks. And these classification networks, the simple one is the CNN. And I just want to show something, like you know, our top taken challenge, because um, um, it's nice. So people started doing this kind of thing and worrying about all, all kinds of stuff here. And you know, like um, we have a conference called ML for Jets. It's historically called ML for Jets. It should be like really a machine learning for particle physics, but it's called ML for Jets. And like you know, this is where people meet and discuss these kind of issues. Um, it's a conference I know about the, average, like the youngest average age, as to say. I'm always, uh, I, I think me and like two other people, like, we always see old guys, and I think everybody else is like, you know, you know, closer to the age of my daughter than to me. And like, you know, it's a very excited conference and stuff like that, and we compare results. And there is a very, very strong and extremely useful tradition in machine learning conferences to have data challenges. So what people do in machine learning conferences, you will find all, all, this all, all over the place. Like, you know, some, somebody like publishes a data set and a task. And then they say, okay, here, here's a data set, here's your task. And in our case, there was this top taken thing. And we said, like, we published this in um, one of the machine learning conferences because we were worried, like, you know, what's the best architecture? And we told people, like, try play with it. And then, like, you know, next year, a year from now in Chicago, we meet and we see what comes up. And we did. And um, it was top taking, and it's um, the, the conver convolutional networks. And I just want to explain to you, like, you know, how the output looks before we, like, you know, end and continue tomorrow. So what you typically produce for all of these classification tasks, your um, um, you plot your results because you know it's very hard to compare them. You plot your results in a two-dimensional space. Um, one way of doing that is here. This is the efficiency, like, you know, of getting the signal out, right? So, like, you know, this is true positive. And then this one here is um, 1 over the fake rate. And actually, we typically log um, 1 over epsilon b. And any tagger, any, like, classification tool, anything you want, will always give a curve in this plot. So this is a log here, and this goes from 0 to 1. Um, this is how they look. This is called an ROC curve, or receiver oper operator characteristic. It basically gives you, for a certain signal efficiency, the background rejection that you can achieve with the tagging tool. This is, for classification, I don't know, for those of you who don't know this, kind of, this is, for classification, this is what everybody talks about. It's all ROC curves. In the, the way I, read, I draw them, like forget about the details, upright is better here, right? And like, you know, I'll show you tomorrow that like, you know, top tagging was one of these curves, and I'll show you like, also in the, in the lecture notes, I'll show you, you know, like, you know, where the different networks came up. So like, let's call, this is the CNN curve here. Um, a typical tagger is, of course, has an ROC curve, but then it's usually actually defined just as a working point, what Atlas, Atlas or CMS do. That would like sit here. Um, like, you know, where like for the same signal efficiency, your background rejection is a factor 10 worse or something like this. And that is like, let, let's just call this my tagger so I don't offend anybody else. Like, you know, my tagger sits there and looks very, very pathetic in comparison. And the next question is, that we'll try and try next time is, are the CNNs, are they really the best networks to do that? Or can I use other network architectures inspired by other machine learning applications invented by other people? Um, can I use them to like, you know, take this kind of what we call low-level data and make a better, better tagger? But that's for tomorrow. Thanks. And there's also coffee. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Peter. Thank you. So. We're moving into physics. Yes. Yes. Answering the fundamental question, is that physics? Is, is CNN yes. the best network? I don't know. I don't uh, look, I mean, it's suggestive, right? <laughs> um, oh, wait, let me switch off the microphone. Let me talk about that. <laughs>